Well, good evening, everyone. Gonna, the whole building's gonna tip like this. Gord's gonna end up in the ceiling, you guys. Poor guy. <laughs> well, happy Saturday. Very uh, lovely to be together. First Sunday in Advent, which is honestly, I'm a, I'm a huge Christmas nerd. I love, uh, I love the Advent season. Love singing these songs and uh, most of all, remembering the story that we get to uh, journey through. Um, as we begin, I want to read some words from the prophet Jeremiah. But before before I do, I just wanted to just offer this uh, sort of frame of mind. I think often we um, come into the Christmas season, the Advent season, and we are uh, kind of remembering a time when you know it's like when we have when we celebrate you know your birthday. It's it's the anniversary of the day that you were born. And in some ways, we're doing that right. We're remembering that Jesus was born on a day, came into the world at one point in history, and we're remembering that day. But more than that, we're, we're letting Jesus be born again in us. We get to experience this birth of Christ in us, in this world, and this reminder that God has journeyed much farther than we ever could. The journey that we take in our heart and in our spirit um, is seems seems large sometimes seems like a real gap uh, to, to walk through sometimes our hearts just aren't in this relationship with god sometimes it takes us a while to uh, get into this uh, mood of worship and as hard as sometimes it is for us to feel like we can overcome our own stuff to encounter god god has has crossed a great divide to be with us and we get to remember that and experience it all at the same time in this season of advent and we get to look forward to a day when the, the promise of a new life and a new heaven and a new earth comes to pass in fullness. So we remember, we experience, and we look forward to another day all at the same time in the season of Advent. So as we journey through it together, friends, I just want to, to, to offer that for you and invite you to have that frame of mind. We'll begin with these words from the prophet Jeremiah. Verse 33 Sorry, in chapter 33, verse 14, he writes, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. He shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. So I want to invite you, friends, to stand with us. We're going to sing of this promise of an eternal king who will reign forever.
Please be a weapon that stops all anxiety. Let it in.
this heart into this place and drawing us in, drawing us close. We pray that you are revealed to us in exactly the way that we need to experience you. God, would you speak to us and show us who you truly are? Would you shape us into the likeness of Christ? Help us to show you to the world that we step out of this place into. So uh, welcome, one and all. Welcome to Saturday. I should turn this microphone on. Dun, da, da, da. There it is. Excellent. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Saturday. Welcome to uh, the river. Uh, for those of you who are online, uh, thanks for joining us uh, here this day. Um, we're about to uh, allow our children to uh, depart uh, with Andrea. She's at the back and she's ready to receive you. We're just thankful for all the different volunteers um, that are not parents, but are perhaps grandparents, but they're not parents and they're helping out, taking turns and helping out downstairs. So we're just really thankful for that. And um, at this point, if uh, there's any children left, you can depart with Andrea on your way down. I'll make my way up. And... Uh, as Paul said, we are beginning an Advent series here, and um, it is uh, the sense of Christmas. Uh, we are looking at the five different senses through which we can experience uh, Christmas through. Uh, so today is touch, next week is smell, the week after that is a taste. And with taste, I just want to give you a heads up, we're looking to move into the gymnasium for that service. We're going to be sitting at tables. We're going to be sampling a, uh, a Christmas feast, if you will. It, it's an ancient one, but a, a Christmas feast nonetheless. We're going to be sampling it there. It's also communion. It's the second Saturday in the month, and so we're going to also be having communion there around the table. And then we're going to be doing sounds of Christmas on the, the 18th. It's kind of like a candlelight service. Um, it's kind of the, the feel of it. And then, of course, Christmas Eve, which is going to be on a Friday, at 4 p.m., we're gathering here, and we'll talk about and look through uh, the sights of Christmas uh, for all that the Lord has in store for us. A little bit more and all of that uh, later on. Uh, lastly, on all these services coming up, there's New Year's Day. New Year's Day falls on Saturday, so we're looking to meet here on Saturday at 6 p.m., and we're going to be looking at promises, past, present, and future. And it'll be a, a service where you can engage and engage in different ways. And so we look forward uh, for you joining us here on Saturday, January 1st, 2022. We need your participation to engage in these five services. You know, we need people to read Bibles. We need people to set up and take down. We need some prop placements uh, at different services and so on. Uh, it takes a village to be a village. Right, so please consider joining in fun. If you get a phone call, please, you know, hesitate before you say no and actually say yes. <laughs> or if you just feel it in your heart to say, hey, I can help in some way, plug me in somewhere, um, we'd love to have you uh, help out and, and make this uh, all happen and happen well. Today is a transforming lives value that we have. Uh, we have four different values here at the river. Uh, they are loving people. Uh, igniting faith, transforming lives, and stewarding resources. And so we tend to think of our worship service as one of the avenues of transforming lives. Uh, Paul mentioned that in his opening phrases about, uh, or maybe it was the prayer before, but about how our service forms us and transforms us, and because it's the presence of God that's alive and at work. More actively, on the other six days of the week, it's through our social justice initiatives uh, that a transforming lives is somewhat uh, an environment is created for that. So here to share with us via video format is Melissa Hillary with an update on a few of our current initiatives. Please watch.
right, the sense of Christmas. Gloria um, initiated a, at our house that we would read Jesus Calling a, a Bible Storybook um, before our uh, meal times at night in the hopes that as our grandchildren come over that they would also be joining in with us as well. Um, she read the, the very first paragraph and it caught my attention. It says, ABC 123, everything begins somewhere. Imagine a place with nothing to see, hear, taste, touch, or smell. No earth, no sky. In the beginning, there was nothing but God the Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. God had a plan to create something big. And if you know the rest of the story, well, you know that uh, he did create something very big. And that, that bigness, in all that bigness, he also created within us the ability to have five senses through which we experience the world. And with those five senses, it creates a sense of who we are. And it is that sense of Christmas that we are looking for um, here in this Advent series. I'd like to start tonight by uh, reading from uh, Luke 1, verses 39 to 45. Luke 1, verses 39 to 45. It's going to be on the screen. But I'm going to ask you to imagine that... I, I ask you to just close your eyes and to listen to the story and then to imagine the details as they occur. The setting is Mary has just been told that she is going to be pregnant with child with the Savior, and that her cousin Elizabeth is also going to be uh, with child, and so we pick up the story there. So Luke 1, verses 39 to 45. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But who am I? Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Thus far, the reading of God's word here this evening, and all of God's people said. Amen. So I have a question, and, and I'd actually like to direct this question to the ladies in the room who have had a child. And my question is, what did you experience when your child moved within you? And I'd like for you to share that with us. Was there an emotion? Was there a feeling? Was there a sensation? Could you describe to us what that was like to have a child within you and then move? We have two people with mics, and so if you would, just stand up, and they'll come running over to you and ask you to share. Be bold. For me, the experience made the baby real. I might have been um, gaining weight and looking bigger, but when I felt that it's like there actually is a baby there. All right, there's a sudden realization. Yes. Ah. There, there's something beyond me here. All right, cool, thanks. Anybody else? Sensation, emotion, feeling. But I remember, um, for me, it was I felt this tiny little flutter, and I remember thinking, nah. And then I felt it again a few minutes later, and that's when I realized this really is a baby. It's actually moving, but it was just a tiny little, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. Can we have two more people? I know I'm bold. I like pregnant pauses. <laughs> yes, in the back. Kathy. 
And then we have uh, Judy after Kathy. I'm going to talk about what happened after the fact. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will say that after I, I felt this kind of loss mm. after I had my children, how much I missed not having that baby um, inside me. I don't know why. I mean, I, you have the baby in front of you, but I kind of felt kind of a sense of emptiness that mm. it was gone um, after the fact. And I think only moms who have had a baby inside them can kind of um, know what that strange feeling of loss is. Yeah, yeah. I'm seeing a few heads nod. Once uh, that's gone. Yeah. All right. Thank you for sharing that, Kathy. Okay. Judy. My turn. Um, I guess I felt it was rather strange, but <laughs> the first kick, I guess. Um, but it was also exhilarating, exciting, just a lot of anticipation as to what was this little person going to be like. All right. Is it was this? And what was the birth going to be? Like? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for sharing. Is there anybody else before I turn this over? All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, with those thoughts in mind, now let's just turn to the Lord our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you who met each and every one of us in our mother's womb, you entered a womb yourself. And Lord, we can only but imagine what that was like. And we hear from the ladies here as to what it was to have a child within them. And so Lord, we get a sense, but yeah, we are in awe. We are in awe that you would become flesh and that you would dwell among us. We thank you for being that God. We thank you for being our God. And uh, in your name, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So the house I grew up in had a gravity furnace. Most houses today have a forced air furnace where a fan forces the air through the vents and distributes the heat throughout the house. Typically, your forced air goes up by the windows, comes in, and then somewhere centrally there's some cold air returns and it goes back down and then it gets ro rotated this way. A gravity furnace is one that works on the basis of hot air rises and cold air falls. And so in the house where I grew up, the hot air vent was in the center of the house on the two levels, and then it distributed the heat out from there, and then the cold air would fall down often through stairwells. Well, to produce enough heat to rise through that central vent, the furnace needed a very large row of gas burners to fire up. Now, the one in my house where I grew up, it was about the size of a hula hoop this whole big ring of uh, flames. So it was quite large. I was about five years old when it happened. The pilot light had blown out, and my mother went to relight it. A pool of natural gas had formed in the base of the furnace. And when it lit, it exploded with enough force to shatter the window on the door of the furnace. And some of the glass deeply cut my mother's arm on her wrist. This is the 1960s. The doctors connected the muscles and tendons back, but they could not reconnect the nerves. As a result, my mother lost the sensation of touch in two of her fingers, the pointer finger and her middle finger. It was always a marvel to see my mother pick things up with her right hand. She would use her ring finger and her pinky along with the thumb pad to pick things up. Of course, she had to be careful whenever handling anything hot, uh, taking care not to burn those two fingers that had lost their sensation of touch. And doing some hand sewing was touch and go. The sense of touch is often taken for granted, that is, until you lose it. I never fully realized how much my mother lost until I, too, lost sensation in my two forefingers seven years ago. I suffered from a pinched nerve between my sixth and seventh cervical vertebrae, and it's only now that the sensation is about 90% restored. Touch. This is the first sense that we wish to look at this Christmas. 
within our Christmas reading, we often come across this story of Elizabeth's baby leaping in her womb, and, and we kind of gloss over it, marveling at the detail that it was a pregnant Mary that caused this reaction, and all eyes turn on to Mary. So let's pause for a moment and reflect on Elizabeth. Elizabeth was the wife of the priest Zechariah, who was chosen to go into the Holy of Holies that year. Elizabeth herself was the daughter of a family of priests. Elizabeth was a godly woman, a faithful follower of God, Yahweh. A faithful follower, despite the sadness in her life. You see, Elizabeth was barren. She had had no children. And add to that, she was now old. Thus, she would never be able to have children. But that changed when God intervened. The angel Gabriel came to priest Zechariah, husband of Elizabeth, and told him while he was in the Holy of Holies that Elizabeth would be with child. And together, they would have a son. And he was to be named John. You might say, Elizabeth was touched by God in her old age, and God made her barren womb fertile. God has an amazing ability to do that. He did that more than once throughout the Bible, more than twice. And God did not just touch Elizabeth, but also he touched Mary. Mary, a virgin, became pregnant because God touched her too. And that's where we picked up the story in our opening text. Mary has just been told by an angel the power of the Most High would overshadow her, that is, impregnate her. And Mary got ready and hurried over to visit her relative Elizabeth. When she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth, that's when the baby in Elizabeth leapt for joy. Elizabeth, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, felt her baby leap for joy within her womb. What a feeling that must have been. First, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then to feel your baby leap for joy. As a man, I can only imagine what that might feel like. And as a woman, well, we heard a few stories here today. Elizabeth felt her son's joy at the sound of the Savior Mother's voice. Elizabeth felt the touch of Jesus also in her life. Now that is something to ponder, the touch of Jesus in her life. Have you been touched by Jesus? Has your life felt the touch of Jesus? There are numerous accounts within the gospel where Jesus touches the lives of others. Many, in fact, are the accounts of the touch of Jesus impacting people. Matthew 8, verse 3 Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man with leprosy and healed him. Matthew 17 tells of Jesus' transfiguration and the three disciples with him fell to the ground in terror. And Jesus came and he touched them. Get up, he said. Do not be afraid. Matthew 20 shares the story of two blind men who asked Jesus to heal them. Verse 34 says, Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately they received sight and they followed him. Mark 5 gives us the story of the bleeding woman who reached out and touched Jesus' cloak, and she was instantly healed. And right after that, Jesus touches Jairus' daughter. He took her by the hand and he healed her. Then there's the time that Jesus healed the deaf and the mute man. Jesus placing his fingers first in the man's ears and then touching his tongue, <laughs> he healed him. Be opened, he said. And do you remember when Peter cut the ear off the servant of the high priest there in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus touched the man's ear and healed him. To be touched by Jesus is to experience change in your life. Have you experienced Jesus' touch in your life? It wasn't that long ago that I was asked why. Why in North America? Why we no longer witness healings? 
It continues to occur in Africa, perhaps even in South America, so why not here? Do we believe that healings ended with when the apostles died? Do we not have enough faith? Why do we resist the idea of miraculous healings? I'm not sure of the reasons, but it is worth investigating. Our text for today says that the immediate response to Jesus' touch is one of joy and thanksgiving. Elizabeth expressed joy when she said, Blessed are you, and blessed is the child you carry. And the baby, John, leapt for joy in Elizabeth's womb. And then thanksgiving was expressed. Why am I so favored that you should come to me, Elizabeth says to Mary. The people that Jesus touched throughout his ministry also expressed joy and thanksgiving. Countless times we were told that people healed by Jesus were joyous and thankful. For me, the most impactful story is when a woman came to Jesus and cried tears of joy and thanksgiving all over his feet, wiping her tears up with her hair while he was eating at a Pharisee's house. Joy and thanksgiving. Has that been your experience too? After Jesus touched you, did you experience joy and thanksgiving? Jesus continues to touch people today. I trust that you know that. Now, I have been asking you if you have felt Jesus' touch. And I hope and pray that you have felt his touch, his life-transforming touch. Whether you were born into a Christian home or you are new to the faith, Jesus touches our lives in countless ways. His touch is what makes you compassionate towards others. His touch is what makes you able to forgive others. His touch is what makes you turn your heart towards the Father. His touch is what makes you at peace with yourself. His touch is what prepares you for a life of loving God. His touch is what prepares you for a life of loving others. His touch is what makes it possible for your lives to touch others. Sometimes that happens in grand gestures. You know, bailing someone out of jail, paying the school tuition fees on someone else's behalf, paying the rent or deposit for a homeless person to get a lease, becoming a kidney donor, and then actually doing it. Running into a house on fire to save a person trapped within. Or diving into the North Saskatchewan River to save a drowning person. Grand gestures. Sometimes we touch people's lives in simpler ways. Giving someone a hug when they need it. Making supper for a family suffering tragedy. Bringing pizza and a movie to a family that is housebound giving a stranded driver a boost to start their car, shoveling the sidewalks for a neighbor and being a snow angel, babysitting for a young family so that they can go out on a date night. The possibilities are endless. Simple gestures that touch people's lives. Sometimes, we touch people's lives in creative or inventive ways. Sometimes in ways that we could never have imagined what the outcomes would be. We are blessed to bless. Yes, we are blessed. And we have been touched so that we can touch others. I'd like to share a story with you. Uh, Forgive me if I have told you this story once before. Uh, my memory seems to be slipping. Or maybe it's deja vu, I'm not sure. But I was a chaplain at the Foothills Hospital in Calgary. And I was assigned to the burn unit. Every Wednesday and Thursday, I entered the burn unit. Robin was her name. Her hands, her legs, her face, her torso burned. 
She was not responding well to therapy or skin grafts. One Wednesday, it occurred to me to give her a foot massage. So on Thursday, I brought in some massage oil. The next Wednesday, I attended the clinical rounds. This is where all the doctors and all the different disciplines meet around in this large room, and we all talk about the patients in the ward and, and the process and progress and all that, and we just, it's called clinical rounds. Robin had turned a corner sometime on Friday, they said. She was responding. She was thriving. She was healing. I was amazed at the quick turnaround by her, and, and so were the medical staff. They were at a loss as to why the sudden change. But Robin knew. And she expressed her utmost joy and thanksgiving to me for what I had done. I don't know if she ever told of the medical staff, but she told me every time I came to visit her. Joy and thanksgiving. A very human response to being touched. I'd like to share one more story. This time it's uh, a little more metaphorical, but I think you'll get it once the story is finished. It has long been my desire to play a violin. It, perhaps it's because of my uh, father's influence of playing classical uh, music at home and, and hearing it, and, and the violin just sounds like the perfect instrument that just pulled on my strings. And so uh, it was just often a dream, and one day I was at seminary in British Columbia, and in between classes I went to a thrift store, and there in the thrift store was a violin. And so I bought it. Now, it's a very small violin. <laughs> it's a quarter-size violin. It's, it's the size of a violin that a child would learn on. But when I bought it, it was so ratty and dusty and grimy, and there's still a little bit of tape that I hesitated to peel off, fearing what might happen, but I polished it up, I put new strings in, I bought a bridge, and I bought some fine tuners, and, and uh, you know, I, was, I didn't have a bow, it didn't come with a bow, so I couldn't play it right away, but I fixed it up so that I could. About five years later, my son and I are going through a uh, pawn shop called Liquidators. Maybe you've heard of that place back in the day. They were quite popular. And uh, they had brand new violins for sale there. So I bought a full size, and my son bought a three-quarter size. And within a week, my son was playing Silent Night, Holy Night. It was like playing Nintendo all over again. You know, he's just so good at it. There's no way that I could compete. So, could I play a note on this violin? No. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. I cannot play a single note on the violin. Not this one, nor any one. But let me show you a video about a violin and what it takes to play. Video one with their life out of tune, battered and scarred. And they're auctioned off cheap to a thankless world, much like that old violin. Who do you know that is battered and scarred? Maybe they're not homeless. Maybe they are not battered financially. Maybe they're not, maybe they are battered emotionally, relationally. Physically, maybe it's you. Oh, but then the master comes.
It takes the touch of the master to play the violin and to play it well. It takes the touch of the master to heal someone and to heal them well. You and I are invited to touch other people's lives the best we know how. But it will always take the touch of the master to truly impact their lives. May Jesus touch others the same way that he has touched us. Shall we pray? Thank you, Jesus, for touching the lives of Mary and Elizabeth. I thank you for touching the lives of so many throughout your walk on earth. Thank you for touching countless lives ever since your life, death, and resurrection has touched us. Thank you for your touch. Amen. One more time, friends. Sing a song of worship to this transforming God who touches us.
joy of his touch on your life. 